Congo Free State in the early 1900s was an absolute monarchy privately owned by King Leopold II, the constitutional monarch of Belgium. Under King Leopold's cruel regime, the people of Congo were ruthlessly forced to work to satisfy his insatiable greed for raw materials and wealth. During this challenging time, the village of Bambuti, known for being hunters and gatherers, became a target of King Leopold's exploitation. One fateful day, the force publique, soldiers under King Leopold's command, attacked the village, taking the men into slavery and slaughtering the women and children. However, one man survived, having luckily escaped the chains of slavery or perhaps death due to his routine hunting trips outside the village. But fate has worse in store for him, as he would have his identity stripped away and his humanity denied. Meet Oda Benga, a Congolese man who experienced terrible racial prejudice and was forced to live among animals. Some of the things discussed in this video may be offensive or disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Oda Benga Born in 1883 in Mambudi, Mbai Oda Benga was a 4 foot 11 inches hunter and wanderer who explored the wilderness with a curiosity that seemed boundless until tragedy stained his life story. In his early 20s, his village fell victim to the horrific action of King Leopold's militia, leaving Oda Benga grieving after the brutal murder of his wife and two children during the attack. Yet fate was not done testing him, as he would also get captured and forced into labor by slave traders from a rival tribe, the Bachelele, where he would encounter an American explorer who would alter his destiny forever. An unfortunate beginning. In 1904, Samuel Philip Werner, an American businessman, came to Africa on a mission to bring back small statured traditional African men who were known as pygmies for the St. Louis World Fair exhibition. Werner, having encountered the pygmy villagers of Batwa in Congo Free State before, decided to revisit its village. Along the way, he crossed paths with the Batwa slavers who had imprisoned Oda Benga. Struck by the friendly nature of Oda Benga, Werner negotiated his release, offering the Bashalele tribe a roll of cloth and a pound of salt in exchange for Oda Benga's freedom. However, Werner's mission needed to be completed, as he needed to convince the scared villagers of Batwa to accompany him back to Louisiana. But because he was a white man, Suspicion hung heavy in the air from the villagers, thus frustrating his mission. So, Oda Benga decided to help him convince the villagers, having developed a friendly bond with Werner. He told the villager how Samuel Werner had saved him from the Bachelele cannibals and told him tales of his beautiful city. Moved by Oda Benga's testimony, four Batwa pygmy males and five Bakuba men, including the son of their ruler, King Ndombe, decided to take the leap of faith and follow Werner. However, neither Oda Benga nor Samuel Werner, who would bring him to America, could have foreseen the twists of fate awaiting this short pygmy man. A Life of Captivity After successfully gathering the pygmies in June 1904, Samuel Werner became ill with malaria so he could not return to Louisiana for the St. Louis World Fair. So, his crew, accompanied by Oda Benga and fellow pygmy companions, returned to Louisiana, leaving him behind. Upon their arrival in Louisiana, the Africans became the significant attention in the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. But among the Africans, Oda Benga stood out, becoming an instant curiosity to the white people not just for his friendly personality, but also for his fearsome, ritualistically sharpened teeth, which almost looked like fangs, causing thousands of people to visit the fair to witness the unique Oda Benga, as the press fondly called him. In no time, his popularity scaled, reaching unimaginable heights, 
The newspapers even called him the only genuine African cannibal in America. However, as time passed, the Africans at the fair learned to make money from this situation, charging visitors to look at their unique features. Oda Benga, in particular, was said to have charged five cents for a display of his sharpened teeth, and this display, the media reported, was worth every cent. Yet, although things sounded great for the Africans, the reality behind the scenes of this believed golden opportunity fair was far more degrading than the public eye could perceive. And this Samuel Werner would discover when he finally arrives at the exposition in July. On Werner's arrival, he found that the pygmies were treated more like captives than performers. He also discovered that after a savage performance by the Africans, the managers had confined the Africans, calling on the military for intervention as they had perceived them as threats. Despite this unfair treatment, Odabanga found an unexpected ally in the Apache leader, Geronimo, who admired his spirit and gifted him an arrowhead after a performance of warlike imitation of the Native Americans. Eventually, the fair ended after some months, and Samuel Werner decided to return the Africans to Congo. On getting to Congo, rather than going his own way, Odabenga followed Samuel Werner, briefly settling in Batwa, where he would marry a Batwa woman who said to have later died from a snake bite. But having no purpose, Odabenga decided to return to the United States with Samuel Werner. The Man at the Museum in the United States, Werner approached the American Museum of Natural History in New York for employment, and his offer was rejected. However, while he was not given the job, Oda Benga's unique appearance caught the eye of Henry Bumpus, the museum's curator. Intrigued by his appearance, Bumpus welcomed Oda Benga into the museum, giving him a place to stay and employing him to entertain visitors. But unknown to Oda Benga, this act of kindness would take him into new chapters of his life, one that would challenge societal norms and push the boundaries of human ethics. At the museum, despite the clear contrast to his own culture, Oda Benga initially found solace. He was given a southern-style linen suit to wear while entertaining and drawing the attention of museum visitors. But this attention was a bittersweet experience as it momentarily dulled the feeling of homesickness. But as months passed, his spirit withered and a profound homesickness engulfed him. According to two writers, Bradford and Bloom, who describe Oda Benga's anguish at the museum at the time, what at first held his attention now made him want to flee. For so long, it was maddening to be inside, to be swallowed whole. He had an image of himself, stuffed behind glass, but somehow still alive, crouching over a fake campfire, feeding meat to a lifeless child. Museum silence became a source of torment and noise. He needed birdsong, breezes, and trees. More desperate to leave, Oda Benga attempted to escape, but was unsuccessful. So, he resorted to acts of rebellion. Once, he was said to have acted ignorant of basic understanding, throwing a chair across the room, narrowly missing the head of a wealthy donor's wife. Unfortunately, while this turmoil was ongoing, his friend and master, Samuel Werner, was also experiencing terrible financial difficulty, being unable to get a job for himself and struggling to make ends meet. Werner could not take Oda Benga back to Congo. So, in 1906, Oda Benga's employer, Henry Bumpus, suggested Werner take Oda Benga to the Bronx Zoo, where he would again become the centerpiece of a horrific exhibition. The Animal Man Now within the confines of the Bronx Zoo, Oda Benga was viewed not as a person, but as an exotic curiosity. Initially, William Hornaday, the director of the zoo, had hired him to assist in caring for the animals. However, he soon realized that the visitors had taken a particular interest in Oda Benga rather than the animals. So, he featured him in an exhibition, stripping off his humanity and paying him no salary for his daily display. 
With no friends or family around, Oda Banga immediately formed an unexpected bond with an orangutan named Du Hong, famous for performing tricks and imitating human behavior. Together, they would become a celebrated duo, captivating audiences every September afternoon. As absurd as this exhibition was, Madison Grant, the secretary of the New York Zoological Society, supported it, aiming to use Oda Benga for an ape exhibition in the zoo. Luckily for Oda Benga, not everyone was blind to this injustice as African-American clergymen, led by James H. Gordon, raised their voices against it. In Reverend Gordon's protest, he stated that the intended exhibition of Oda Benga alongside an ape was an insult to the African race and a contradiction to Christian beliefs. He also argued that a Darwinian theory sought to dehumanize Oda Benga. Surprisingly, in response to Reverend Gordon's protest, an editorial in the New York Times dismissed the outcry, deeming it unnecessary sympathy for Oda Benga and arguing that Oda Benga's fate was no different from that of other pygmies. Meanwhile, as these controversies were ongoing, Oda Benga's behavior grew increasingly violent, and the zoo was forced to release him back into the hands of his master, Samuel Werner. However, challenges loomed even with this new freedom, as he needed more money to return to his hometown. So, Werner advised him to stay in the United States for a better life, since he could not take Oda Benga back to Congo due to his financial situation. Luckily for Oda Benga, Reverend Gordon requested to take him in, thus ending his unfortunate captivity. A Free Man Under Reverend Gordon's care, Oda Benga was sent to the Howard Colored Orphan Asylum, where he would thrive, feeling a sense of freedom. However, the intrusive gaze of the press followed him causing Reverend Gordon to relocate him to Lynchburg, Virginia in January 1910, where he would spend his last days living with the family of Gregory W. Hayes. To further shield Oda Benga from the prying eyes of the press, Reverend Gordon arranged for dental care, capping his sharpened teeth and clothing him in American-style attires. He would also enroll him for English tutoring in Lynchburg from a poet, Ann Spencer and an elementary school at the Baptist Seminary Lynchburg. However, when his English improved, he left school, getting a job at the Lynchburg Tobacco Factory, hoping to save some money to return to Congo. 1914, after saving a considerable sum of money, he tried returning to the Congo. Tragically, World War I started, disrupting his plans. On the 20th of March, 1916, he reached a breaking point, ending his life with a shot to his heart using a borrowed pistol after building a ceremonial fire and chipping off his capped teeth. So, what are your thoughts on this? Let us know in the comments section below and remember to hit that subscribe button. To watch more insane and unique stories, click on the video options on the screen. You won't regret it.